Welcome to the biology section of our practice MCAT questions. In this video, we're going to be going through questions 96 to 100. So first, I'll show you guys the questions so that you can pause the video and attempt them on your own. Here's question 96, 97, 98, 99, and 100. Now let's go through the questions together. In question 96, we're asked which of the following amino acids is a common target of protein kinases. So for this, you need to know what do protein kinases do, and then which of these amino acids is a common target. So keep in mind, we're saying common target. In this, there are two that could be potential targets, but the one that's the most common out of the options given is the one you want to choose. So kinases, what do they do? You should know that they are responsible for phosphorylation. That's when you add a phosphate group to some other molecule. So in this case, we're phosphorylating some part of an amino acid. And the things that get phosphorylated the easiest would be oxygen. Nitrogen can also be phosphorylated a little bit, but the most commonly phosphorylated thing you see is oxygen. Another would be sulfur too. But oxygen that's what you should think of when you think protein kinases and you should think of an OH group. Something that has an OH group, a hydroxide group, rather than other oxygen groups. So a double bond to an oxygen, that's not going to get phosphorylated. It's a single bonded oxygen and that's also single bonded to a hydrogen. And so if we look at our amino acids that are given to us, here is a chart with all the amino acids. First of all, we have threonine, which should be right here. And look at that, there's the OH group. So threonine could be phosphorylated. What else do we have? Arginine, tryptophan, glutamate. Arginine, we have a positively charged center over here that is distributed to the other nitrogen as well. But in any case, that positive charge is not going to be phosphorylated. Something with a charge like that is not going to have something else attached to it. That phosphate group is not going to attach. So arginine, no. Tryptophan has this nitrogen, but no, it's not commonly phosphorylated. It's already too bulky anyway, so it's not likely that this thing would really be accessed by an amino acid and then, or sorry, by an enzyme and then be phosphorylated here. Better to have something more accessible. And then with glutamic acid, let's say that it's the acid form instead of glutamate, and it doesn't have this negative charge, this one could potentially be phosphorylated. So keep that in mind. There are two of the answer options given that could be phosphorylated. This OH group could be phosphorylated if it's still, you know, as an OH. It also could be phosphorylated if it's negatively charged. But either way, glutamic acid can be phosphorylated as well but not as often as threonine. Threonine is much easier to phosphorylate with that OH group. With glutamic acid, sometimes it has a negative charge, sometimes it doesn't. And then it's also doing a whole resonance thing between two different oxygens. One is double bonded while the other is not, but there's no double bonding going on with threonine. So the question asked us, which one is a common target of protein kinases, meaning phosphorylation? Our best answer is going to be threonine because this is commonly phosphorylated. Arginine is not. Tryptophan is also not. Glutamic acid can be, so keep that in mind, but it's not a common target. Therefore, it's not a great answer compared to option A. In question 97, we're asked which of the following is an expected effect of decreased calcitonin secretion. So we have a decreased amount of calcitonin. What does calcitonin do? We have to know that before we can answer what happens when we don't have enough of it for a homeostasis level. So calcitonin, you should know that its responsibility is to decrease blood concentrations of calcium. So it decreases blood calcium. That's what it does. Calcitonin, I think of it as nin, sounding kind of like none. I want none of this calcium in my blood. So it's kind of reducing the calcium level. If you have more calcitonin, you're going to have lower and lower blood calcium levels. And then it acts antagonistically to parathyroid hormone. 
that's released by the parathyroid, and that increases the blood calcium level. So we can, affect, we can expect that if we have decreased level of something which lowers the blood calcium, then we have a higher than normal blood calcium concentration. Option A is saying diffuse steroid hormone effects throughout the body. No, it's not really related to steroids. B, decrease thyroid hormone function. No, this is incorrect. It's actually released by the thyroid. It's another hormone that's released by the thyroid, but the main hormone that's thyroid hormone is related more so to metabolism. And it acts antagonistically to parathyroid hormone, not the thyroid. So that one is not really some, that's something which kind, kind of might trip you up, that answer option, but it's not correct. Option C is saying an increased serum calcium. This one is correct. Just thinking about the main function of calcitonin, and if we have less of it, then we have the opposite effect of what it normally does, increased serum calcium, so higher blood calcium level. And finally, D is saying salt wasting by the kidneys. This is more so related to the salts that the kidneys is, is mainly responsible for, then that would be sodium and potassium, and so that's different than calcium. So it's not really going to be something which involves the kidneys as much. In question 98, which of the following refers to the innermost tissue layer in a developing embryo? So you just need to know the order of these. The way I like to think of it is endo kind of sounds like under, which is saying that it's under the other three, so it's the one that's all the way in the inside. You can also think of it as end. It's at the end. If you're thinking about from the outside and you're looking in, it's the one you see at the end. So endo is inner. Meso has that M, which you can remember as middle. And then ecto is just the remaining one. It's the one that's at the outside. It's the outermost. Ecto kind of sounds like exoskeleton. And I keep it in my head that an exoskeleton, you know, is a skeleton on the outside, ectoderm on the outside. So this is the order of them. And we're asked which one is the innermost tissue layer. That would be, be the endoderm. An exoderm is not even an answer. It's not even something that exists in regards to tissue layers. So ignore that option. In question 99, it says in a dihybrid cross, with parents that are heterozygous for both traits, what is the probability of producing an offspring that is also heterozygous for both traits? So we have a dihybrid cross. That means that we are doing a cross between two organisms and we're looking at two alleles instead of just one. So you can do this using a Punnett square. The parents are heterozygous for both traits. So if I have a trait A, they're heterozygous for it, and then also a trait B, they're heteros heterozygous, meaning they have one copy of both the dominant and the recessive allele, the recessive version of the allele. And then we want to know the probability of having an offspring that's also heterozygous for both traits. So if you do a Punnett square and set this up, you will get something like this. So just set up, if we're looking at R and Y as the two alleles instead of A and B, just write down all the possible formations of alleles that you pass down can that can happen so all the possible gametes so if they have this genotype for the parent they can pass down for example the big r if they're choosing between the big and the little r and then between the y's they could pass down the big y and then the second one is if they pass down again the big y but now it's sorry the big r but now it's the little y and then just do all the possible gametes. So these are the four possible choices for one parent at the top and then the four possible choices to the left. There's your Punnett square. Now let's look at ones in which the offspring is heterozygous for both traits. There's one over here. These ones are not. One over here. Another one. And another one. And therefore, we only got four out of the 16 possible offspring. So four out of 16, which is also equal to one over four. So approximately one fourth of their offspring will be heterozygous for both traits. In question 100, 
it says that a strand break temperature for a particular DNA molecule is defined as a temperature at which exactly 50% of the AT bonds in a strand of DNA are split. If this temperature is, for example, 120 degrees for a particular DNA strand, which of the following is true? So at this temperature, strand break temperature, we're saying exactly 50% of the AT bonds are split. So AT bonds are broken. Now we're asked what is true for a particular strand if we have this as its strand break temperature. So for this question, it, all the answer options you can see are talking about CG strands. So just know that in an AT bond, you have two hydrogen bonds, whereas between C and G, we have three H bonds. So what this is saying is that there are additional bonds between C and G, those nucleotides versus A and T, and therefore they're more strongly held. And when you break apart DNA strands, what you're doing is you're breaking those hydrogen bonds so that the strands are split. So at a certain temperature, if we're saying that exactly 50% of the AT bonds are broken, and it's harder to break the GC bonds because there's an extra bond holding them together, then it makes sense that at this temperature, we don't have as many GC bonds broken. If they were the same number of hydrogen bonds, then we can say, okay, it's likely that we have the same number of GC bonds broken. If there were fewer, then we have more GC bonds broken. But in this case, we're going to say that since there are more bonds holding G and C together than A and T at this given temperature, more of the GC are still intact. So A is saying greater than 50% of CG strands will be broken. No, we're going to say fewer than 50%. And B is correct. Less than or fewer than 50% of the CG strands will be broken at this strand break temperature. And C is saying exactly the same number will be broken. No, that's incorrect. Uh, D is also incorrect. You should know just a very important thing and very common in terms of MCAT questions that you see on practice. And it can likely show up on your actual MCAT is that between AT bonds and CG bonds, there is a difference in the number of hydrogen bonds that hold them together and CG bonds are stronger. So based on that information, we can still kind of extrapolate that less than 50% of those strands are broken. So it's not an exact answer that we're giving. Therefore, we can still say something about the status of the CG strands, but you know it's not an exact answer and you should be able to still extract it based on the information that you have and things that you know about these bonds. So therefore, D is incorrect. And that's it for the questions in this video. If you enjoyed what you saw, make sure to check out our course. The link is right here and also in the description. And other than that, make sure to subscribe to our channel to keep up to date with the videos that we post here. That's it for this video. I'll see you guys in the next one.